welcome to the Rosenbach Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Ames, Associate Curator of the Rosenbach Museum and Library in Philadelphia. This is Season 2, History Behind the Scenes, in which we explore the Rosenbach's remarkable historical collections, travel behind the scenes into the work of the institution to preserve its treasures, and engage in critical conversations about the place of rare books, libraries, and museums in modern-day American civic life. Today, I'm joined by Carlos Obrador, head consul of the Consulate of Mexico in Philadelphia, and Sarah Potts, development associate at the Rosenbach, for a discussion of the Rosenbach's amazing collections documenting the early history of Mexico and a consideration of the state of U.S.-Mexican relations today. When you hear the phrase American history, what kind of history comes to mind? For many of us, the immediate image is the history of the territory that eventually became the United States of America. But the American history collections of the Rosenbach Museum and Library are vast in their scope and document five centuries of life across North and South America, including colonial New Spain and early independent Mexico. Our co-founder, Dr. A.S.W. Rosenbach, had a deep interest in the history of imperial expansion in the Western Hemisphere from the 1500s through the 1800s, and the interactions of peoples, cultures, and languages that imperialism and colonialism helped create. Those interactions were often violent and destructive for many of the people involved in them. They shaped the world in which we live, making the Rosenbach's collection of materials relating to the histories of North and South America an incredible opportunity to compare how the nation-states we know today emerged from the colonial empires of centuries past. Our collections of Mexican historical material at the Rosenbach include great rarities of early printing, including the first book printed in the Americas in Mexico City in 1544, and manuscripts related to the life of conquistador Hernán Cortés, as well as documents of social historical interest, including legal records and government publications that shed light on the New Spain colony and later independent Mexico. When studied alongside materials relating to the 13 colonies that formed the United States and records of the early U.S. government, we have so much to learn about the similarities and differences of our two nations, and how the United States and Mexico can forge a mutually supportive path forward as we face the challenges of the 21st century. For this episode of the podcast, I'm joined by my valued colleague, Sarah Potts, Development Associate at the Rosenbach. Sarah has a deep interest and background in Spanish language and culture, and she'll be recording a second version of this podcast episode in Spanish. Sarah, thank you so much for partnering with me on this episode of the Rosenbach podcast. Before we dive into our conversation with the head consul, I'm curious to hear from you about what inspired your interest in the Spanish language and Mexican history and what you're most excited to learn from our guest today. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I'm very happy to be here. Very excited. Um, so what sparked my interest in the Spanish language and Mexican history really started in high school. Uh, I went on a 10-day spring break trip to Spain um, with the Spanish department. And honestly, that, that trip changed my life forever. I'm not a native Spanish speaker, and I grew up in white suburbia. So this trip was really my first contact with another culture. I, I really remember being in the Prado, Spain's National Art Museum, and being surrounded by Spanish art and culture from both sides of the Atlantic. And I was just so captivated and inspired me to continue learning the language and growing closer to the history that I fell in love with. Uh, when I went off to college at the University of Utah, I minored in Spanish and received a Bachelor's of Arts in Art History. Now, what's surprising to most people, many Americans, is that Utah was actually part of the Spanish Empire, part of Mexico. Um, and so there's a really rich uh, Hispanic history and culture there that I actually got, you know, to experience a little bit when I was an intern uh, with an organization called Artes de México in Utah, which works with the Mexican consulate in Salt Lake City to promote 
Mexican history and art through bilingual workshops, classes, and outreach programs. It was, it's really a great uh, institution. I'm proud to have been even a little bit a part of it. Uh, this progressed into my decision to go to graduate school and focus my research on Mexican and Latinx arts. So really, my whole life <laughs> since high school has been devoted to this history and this language. Um, and this collection that we're going to talk about today is actually what drew me to, to the Rosenbach. It's very fascinating. Um, what I'm most excited to hear from the consul about is the history of early independent Mexico. In my personal research, I focused a lot on post-revolutionary Mexico, that being after the Mexican Revolution uh, that took place between 1910 and 1920. Uh, so I don't spend a lot of time researching pre, you know, 20th century Mexico. And so I'm very excited to hear from Carlos about, you know, this history and how I can personally broker equitable relationships between Mexico and the U.S. locally here in Philly. Thank you for sharing a little bit about your background, Sarah. And I had no idea, despite, you know, our having known each other now for several months on the Rosenbach staff, I had no idea that it was this collection that had um, drawn you to to our institution, which just goes to show the power of material artifacts and you know, shaping shaping our lives and our understandings of, of of different cultures. So again, really glad that you could be a part of this conversation. Our guest today on, on this episode of the Rosenbach podcast is really the perfect person from whom to learn about you know, U.S.-Mexican relations yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and to think about this interaction of culture and diplomacy, which we've already touched on a bit. Carlos Obrador holds a degree in international relations from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1993, where he was head of the Department for the Protection of Mexicans in Canada until 1997, the year in which he was transferred to the Consulate General of Mexico in Toronto, where he was in charge of the Temporary Agricultural Workers Program. Beginning in August 2004, he served as head of the Office of Trade Promotion and Tourism at the Embassy of Mexico in Canada. From 2009 to 2011, he was deputy consul at the Mexican consulate in Eagle Pass, and from 2012 to 2014, he was deputy consul and cultural attaché at the Consulate General of Mexico in Boston. From August 2014 to June 2016, he was Deputy Director General for Central America at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He served as Mexico's head consul in Del Rio, Texas from June 20, 2016 to October 30, 2019. On November 1, 2019, he took up the role of head consul in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He has been a career member of the Mexican Foreign Service since August 1997. Carlos, thank you so much for joining us on the Rosenbach podcast. We are truly honored and excited to have you with us today. Dear Alex, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you and Sarah and share uh, many things about Mexico, U.S. and the Mexican community in uh, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, the jurisdiction rather of, of the Mexican consulate here. So it's a, it's a wonderful to, to be here today. Um, before we dive into the discussion topic today, um, Alex and I and our listeners would love to learn a bit more about you and how you ended up in the diplomatic service here in Philadelphia. Um, tell us about your work prior to the, appoint to the appointment as head consul and what it's been like serving in Philadelphia. Right. Thank you. Well, actually, let me share with you a little secret. Today, August 25th, I am uh, turning actually 25 years of uninterrupted career service in the Mexican Foreign Service. So it's, it's a wonderful day that coincides with this um, a great interview and uh, opportunity to talk about Mexico at the Rosenbach Museum and Library. Um, so I started, uh, you know, I, I graduated from high school. I, I went to college um, at the National University of Mexico, UNAM. Um, and uh, there I studied international relations. Um, but a little before uh, getting into um, the, the university, I, I went to Quebec 
Canada. And there I, I studied French. And that, that experience really opened my eyes and my mind and, and because I wasn't clear what I wanted to study right after college, uh, high school, sorry. So what I did is I took one year off. I went to Quebec okay. and then I came back to Mexico knowing exactly what I wanted to do. So Quebec gave me that exposure to different, um, you know, people from all over the world. It was 90, 1992, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the, I, I was able to um, study and live with many people from Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, so that, that was the, the initial push or interest for me to study international relations. I graduated in 1994, right at the time where, you know, we were finishing um, negotiating the, the negotiation of the NAFTA agreement. Actually, it was a January of 94. It was the implementation of, of, of NAFTA, the, the North American Free Trade Agreement. So it was a very important time to, you know, to start working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to Alex. Thank you so much for joining us you, for this interview on your anniversary of service. Uh, as a career foreign service official, it's a wonderfully appropriate opportunity to, to reflect on your own work and the future of the relationship between our nations. Can you give our audience a sense of the community you serve here in this region of the United States. How large is the Mexican community in the, the Philadelphia metropolitan area, the mid-Atlantic region, and what kinds of services and programs does the consulate offer? Yes, that's uh, thank you for that opportunity, uh, Alex. Uh, we serve a very large Mexican community um, in the three states that we serve. From Philadelphia, the jurisdiction of the Mexican consulate covers the whole state of Pennsylvania, the state of Delaware, and eight counties of southern New Jersey. In that jurisdiction, we serve approximately 350,000 people in 78 counties across these states. The consulate offers a wide array of services well beyond the mission of uh, identity documents. We have a health window with, with, that with the pandemic, we put a special emphasis on mental health, but also we were able to provide um, COVID um, vaccines at the consulate so everybody was welcome to get their COVID vaccines at the consulate through that uh, partnership with different health organizations. As well, the, we have the education window, which uh, it, it would, uh, a strong orientation for high school and college, as well as an adult education for those who left Mexico before finishing primary or the secondary school. And also we have the, leg the legal affairs and consular protection department, which gives um, information, orientation in, in, in um, issues like migration, domestic violence, labor rights, and um, you name it. It's, it's actually a very comprehensive services that we provide at the consulate. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I didn't know uh, all those services were provided. Those sound very crucial and vital. And I'm so happy that uh, you and the consulate were able to do that, especially the COVID vaccines. That's incredible. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing U.S.-Mexican uh, relations today? And in addition, what are the biggest opportunities? Yes. Um, so, so it's a very, very important question. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I guess the, you know, since the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, was implemented and signed by, by President Biden, that has an impact, direct impact in Mexico. And I will tell you why. Um, it, this is a once in a generation investment in the United States, of course, in infrastructure and competitiveness. Um, but we have, uh, the, the workers and, and the people that could make that possible in United States. 
Uh, let's not forget that we have an important number of, of farm workers and laborers that uh, come on, uh, on a working visas, the H-2A program, the H-2B program. And uh, of course, uh, Mexico is the 11th largest economy in the world, which makes us a medium econo economic power only below countries such as the United Kingdom and Germany. But let's remind the audience that Mexico is as well the United States' second largest export market and its third largest source of imports. Much is also said about remittances, and it is very important to know that as this increase, so does the U.S. economy. The, the average of between $300 and $500 that each person sends to Mexico per month represents only 14% of their salary. At least 86% is reinvested here in the United States. Um, so we have 40, almost 40 million Mexicans uh, living in the uh, in United States. This is uh, m most of them, obviously, like 28 million or are our second, third and fourth generation of Mexican-Americans. But then we have uh, close to 12 million Mexicans that were born in Mexico. And the majority of them are here documented, which means they hold work permits. Uh, they, they are permanent residents or they, hold, they are students as well. I like to say that Mexico and United States, because of family, culture, uh, being neighbors, partners, and friends, we complement each other. Carlos, as the really fascinating information that you just shared underscores, the connections that link Mexico and the United States are so multifaceted. They're geographic, uh, they are family relationships, shared economic interests, uh, linguistic and cultural ties, and, and many more. In, in your opinion, what role can um, fields of study and areas of expression that really operate in the cultural realm, like art, um, literature, history, museums and libraries, what role can these play in building mutual understanding between our two nations and two peoples? I think that's the, the largest link between the United States and Mexico, obviously, is the geography, one of the largest, because we share a very long border, 3,000 kilometers or 2,000 miles of, of a big border. This is uh, obviously encompasses 10 states, six in Mexico and five in, in four in United States, border states. So from there, uh, we, we, we have a very strong interaction, a very interaction, but also integration. If you ever, I, I have served um, uh, at the Texas-Mexico border in two different occasions, two different cities, as, as you mentioned in your kind introduction, um, and you can see there how, how integrated the economy and the life along the border is. Uh, just to give you an example of, um, you know, a final product we produce together, we, we build together. One plant, let's say a subsidiary plant in Un of United States in Mexico and the border, crosses their final product, let's talk about probably airbags for the car industry. One airbag before comes, the final product is installed into that car, crosses the border back and forth to Mexico and back to United States up to seven times before you have the final product. So that tells you about you know, how integrated the economy is. But also, the most importantly, is the families. You know, we share families. I, I was talking about uh, almost 40 million Mexican-Americans living in the United States. We, uh, this is the largest diaspora of one country in another. 
But we do have this uh, similar situation for Americans outside the United States. Not too many people know that uh, one of the largest American communities outside the United States is in Mexico, where depending on the sources that you consult, uh, tells you that 1.5 to 2 million Americans live in Mexico. No other country that has many Americans. And so we're very privileged to share that as well. Family, friends, businesses. Those are so, so truthful words. And even in you know my own experience in, in Utah and here in Philadelphia, it is so clear that our two nations are tied together. Um, and we should we should have pride in that. And I actually didn't know that the largest population outside the U.S. was in Mexico. It makes total sense, but I never knew that. That's so cool. Uh, moving on to our next question. Uh, Carlos, you've been to the Rosenbach on several occasions to view our collection and participate in programs. Uh, can you describe for our listeners uh, what it's like to visit? And what about our Mexican history collection you found the most interesting? Well, yes. Thank you, Sarah, for the question. Uh, let me tell you to start. It's, it's a wonderful trip to a wonderful place, a wonderful location where you can transport yourself through history, through art, and different times since uh, the foundation of, of this wonderful nation, United States, but also there you can see different pieces of art and history, really. So uh, every time I come to the Rosenberg, and I've been there many, many times because it's, it's, it's a place to enjoy, a place to visit and spend hours and hours learning. It's a universe and, and the richness of the materials that you have and put on display and also for people to to learn is 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 amazing. Uh, I congratulate you for all the hard work that you do. You know, bridging the history with the students and putting that into uh, facilitating that to the public in general. So uh, I was struck by the, the Doctrina Breve, which is a wonderful book. Is 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 a very historical book because of the the implications that that have the doctrina breve as you as you of course know was published in mexico city in 1544 and is the oldest surviving book printed in the western hemisphere so just that book has you know tells you about the richness of uh of the materials and the collections that you can find at the rosenbach uh, museum and library. But not only that, an 18th century Mexican book containing the 2,624 anagrams of the angels greeting to Mary, or the prayers book and catechisms in, in Zapotec. So really, you, you have a wide array of material, uh, your guide to rare Mexican government broadsides at the Rosenbach is wonderful. The document, for instance, of Anastasio Bustamante, uh, captain of the internal provinces announcing memorial services for those who lost their lives fighting for Mexico during the independence war uh, with Spain, or the document by Jose Mariano de Michelena, urging citizens to keep the peace and reminding them that Mexico and Spain must retain an amicable relationship. So as, as, as you can see from uh, what I'm, the documents that I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. It's, it's to submerge in history. And I feel like in the, the travels of Jules Verne <laughs> every time I go there. Carlos, we often think about diplomacy as something that involves only heads of state and, and, uh, and government and other high-level officials, you know, negotiating treaties and uh, economic agreements at, at a very top level of our nations. But is there anything that everyday people can do to encourage healthy relationships between nations, in this case specifically between uh, Mexico and the United States? 
Definitely, Alex. I think um, as long as we, you know, uh, understand our the our differences that are uh, our strength as well. You know, different cultures um, uh, nurture and and grow together in diversity. So as long as we know more about the history of United States and the Americans learn more about Mexico, their struggle for independence, which were very similar to the struggle for independence uh, uh, from from England uh, for, for, for United States. Uh, so that will nurture a better understanding of each other. And the Rosenbach Museum and Library help us bridge that gap. Um, so obviously, to learn more about uh, one another. I think that is key to help us understand and build a better, a better world, a more peaceful world through culture and through diplomacy, of course. Thank you so much, Carlos, for joining me and Sarah for this conversation. We at the Rosenbach are so deeply honored to have the opportunity to work with you to study and share our materials related to Mexican history, to consider what they have to teach us today, and to do that work that you just described of bridging the gap, building greater understanding, and using these important artifacts to um, help uh, residents of both the United States and Mexico think about um, our nations in, in human terms. So thank you again very much for being our partner in this important work. On the contrary, thank you uh, for for the invitation to share, um, you know, this little bit of history. There is a long history of friendship with the United States. Um, and so anytime uh, I'll be more than glad to, you know, come back and, and continue our strong collaboration. Thank you for listening to the Rosenbach Podcast. Check back soon for another glimpse into the Rosenbach Museum and Library's remarkable collection of rare books, manuscripts, art, and artifacts, and for more fascinating conversations about history, art, and culture. To learn more about the Rosenbach, visit rosenbach.org. We host a variety of on-site and online events and public programs, and I always welcome questions from listeners about how to use our collections. Our holdings are always accessible to researchers who make a free appointment to visit our reading room. The Rosenbach's community reaches all around the globe, brought together by our love for history, rare books, manuscripts, and the arts. I hope you will consider supporting the Rosenbach Museum and Library and this podcast by becoming a member today. It's one of the best ways to help us with projects like this. Memberships start at just $55 and give you access to everything we have to offer, online and in person. If you cannot make a financial contribution, please give our podcast a good rating on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen to help us build our audience. The theme music for season two of the podcast is a setting of the poem Longings, written by poet, artist, and educator Nellie Rathbone Bright in 1927. Bright co-founded the Black Opals, a collective and literary journal showcasing young Black writers in Philadelphia in the late 1920s. The musical version featured here was performed by Yolanda Wisher, Paul Geis, V. Shane Frederick, Mark Anthony Palacio, and Sir Lance Gamble. Cool the Rosenbach Podcast is supported by a grant from the Evelyn Toll Family Foundation. Thanks again, and I look forward to continuing our conversation about history on the next episode of the Rosenbach Podcast. In the heart of me, drums in my ears, and my lips are wet with the tang of the sea.